last week on Law Express. Client autonomy means that you as the lawyer, you are going to explain their legal rights and obligations in connection with the subject matter they've come to consult you. And once you have done that, they are the ones who decide on the options that they have on the resolution of that matter. So you don't choose for them, but you empower them to make a choice. And then you also explain that once you have made your choice, you trust me to apply my legal knowledge and expertise, <laughs> in quotes, to undertake the representation. The first meeting with a client, there's a lot mm. expected of the lawyer and a lot expected of the client as well. The lawyer is wearing different hats. At the same time, he's listening. Mm. At the same time, she's advising. At the same time, she's evaluating. same time, analyzing. Mm. So the lawyer is wearing so many hats. But these are all intangibles the lawyer is doing. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the problem with the client is that the client doesn't see the importance of these things. You know, because every lawyer sells three things. Mm -hmm. Your time, your integrity, and your intellect. Mm -hmm. These are the things that are packaged as a service to the client. Mm -hmm. So it's necessary for the client to appreciate these things. And these things are not free. From the moment you walk into a lawyer's office, the clock starts ticking exactly. because it's work. It's mm -hmm. work. At that point, the obligations owed to you. Of course, it might be limited where you don't touch on everything. Mm -hmm. But even the initial comments yes. about who you're trying to sue or who is suing you has to be kept confidential. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's not a free service. You need to <laughs> appreciate the fact that if the lawyer decides that you can consult for free, it doesn't mean that that is a norm. Yeah. Yeah. Welcome to Law Express. Last week, we had a very enlightening conversation um, on the topic of the lawyer-client relationship, obligations of the lawyer to the client. We promise to continue the conversation this week as we were unable to exhaust all these obligations owed by lawyers to their clients. Today, we pick up the conversation from where we stopped last week. This is Law Express. Don't go away. We'll go for a quick commercial break. When we return, we get into the rest of the discussion. Nathan Yane is a private legal practitioner with a sincere dedication to mentoring younger lawyers. He is deeply passionate about everything beautiful about Ghana. Victoria Bath, a private legal practitioner and adjunct lecturer at the Ghana School of Law, channels her passion into mentoring young lawyers. Alongside her legal pursuits, she finds joy in reading and spending time with her family. Noela Seydou, she's a private legal practitioner and a consistent member of our three lawyer panel on the show every week. She also doubles as the host of the show. She likes to play tennis and read. So we talked about the mindset of clients about winning at all costs mm -hmm. and the need to let them appreciate that there are limits to what a lawyer can do within the confines of the code of ethics and the rules and procedures that we have to use. The flip side also is that sometimes winning means compromising. You know, um, you may not necessarily come out as the one in whose favor judgment has been given, but you may walk away with what you wanted through that judgment, through a yeah. settlement out of court, or as you may have the case pending in court, but you can have discussions and have an amicable resolution. Mm -hmm. And every lawyer is under a duty. In fact, it is mandatory for you to let the client know that one of the ways to resolve their case is to consider settling it on terms that are fair and do not um, unduly prejudice or compromise their interest. And when you receive instructions and you actually find that a case may not necessarily succeed, but the client may actually benefit from a fair settlement, you have an obligation to tell the client that they should consider settling. It is a different thing if you advise the client and the client says, I'm not interested. 
yes, I see all the benefits of settling, but don't do it. But otherwise, when that client learns that you failed to inform them, you know, they can take you on because you must always advise a client where the case will admit of a fair settlement. So that's one duty that clients must be aware their lawyers owe them. It's a bit problematic where you find a client that you have explained everything to mm -hmm. and made them understand that under the circumstance, a fair settlement, which perhaps the other party is also open to, mm -hmm. would be to their benefit. Mm -hmm. And then they still insist that maybe for some vengeful reason, they, they want to continue to waste everybody's time in court, uh, to litigate. Mm -hmm. it, it can get frustrating, mm -hmm. but what is a lawyer supposed to do? Continue with a brief or use it as a basis to say, look, I've told you what's best for you mm -hmm. under the circumstance. Mm -hmm. This doesn't serve anybody. And so if you are not willing to do what is reasonable, mm -hmm. I'm willing to walk away. Um, if we look and uh, let's say we look at the, the United Kingdom as a jurisdiction, they have a situation now where the lawyer has to show to the court mm -hmm. that indeed they have actually explained the possibility of resolving the matter out of court to the client mm -hmm. and that it is the client's choice to for continue. the matter to go to court. Because if you are not able to show that in the UK, you, the lawyer, you are not going to be able to get your mm -hmm. fees. You know, because in their system, the cost that is awarded, the, you know, the courts will take into consideration the fees the lawyer would take. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know? So if you are not able to show to the court that you actually advised your client about the possibility of reaching an amicable or an out of court settlement, of the issue that has arisen and led to litigation. You know, there are certain sanctions against you. There is a case, Danet versus Real Track PLC, which is the current um, you know, authority on yeah. that particular issue. So it's very important that the lawyer explains to the client that, you know, there is a possibility. If you look at the matter and there is that possibility, bring it to the attention of your client. Don't just take the brief and just run to court because mm. of the fact that you know, your client says no, but explain to the client. And if the client still wants to go ahead, that's, a, I mean, another situation. Mm -hmm. But it's very important that you let the client know that there is this possibility. It sometimes may even be a quicker yeah. way of resolving the issue and the client can go on with whatever they and are. And a cheaper doing. one as yes. well. Possibly a cheaper yes. one, yes. Yes, I mean, that's one thing to highlight, the, the mm -hmm. cost of um, pursuing a matter that runs the risk of not even yielding the yeah. expected results. So usually when you are advising clients to settle, it's one of the things you want to highlight. The, you do a cost benefit analysis and you also want to remind them of the fact that, you know, when you settle, you, 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 you have a lot of control. It's party autonomy as to what you decide to give up and what you will not give up. But when you leave your fate in the hands of a judge, you know, you run the risk of yeah. um, that person making an error, that person with all due deference to our <laughs> judges being incompetent because yeah. it's not every judge who will necessarily be on top of things. So the particular you have to highlight issue, yeah. all those possibilities. And in most cases, um, clients will see the benefits. And once they see that you're advising them in good faith, on the merit of the matter, most people will explore the possibility of settling. That is if they just want justice. Some ah. people mm -hmm. are just out to get back at others. Mm -hmm. And it's not even about the case, it's just to make a point, mm. to show how vindictive they can be and all of that. So if these are the reasons for that litigation, I don't think any reasonable explanation would stop them from insisting yes. that you continue to be in court or mm -hmm. you just keep pursuing a matter that mm -hmm. never ends. Yes. I mean, yeah. for us as lawyers, you can keep bailing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it's to your disadvantage. Exactly. You know, but that yes. legal obligation has been met. Mm. And then there is also this aspect where the rules of procedure are changing and the law now seems to embolden the judge. Mm -hmm. If the judge, mm -hmm. upon looking at the pleadings that the lawyers have filed, is of the view that it is a matter that can best 
be settled yeah. amicably or privately between mm. the parties. The judge is supposed to raise it to the lawyers and to the parties and try to encourage mm -hmm. them to try to take it out and try to resolve it and then report back. Mm -hmm. It is the case when they are able to reach a resolution, whatever comes out of it is put in the form of an agreement that mm -hmm. is signed by both parties mm -hmm. and then it will also be adopted by the court as its judgment. Mm -hmm. yeah. and therefore, if there are certain obligations arising out of it, which one party refuses to perform, mm -hmm. then of course it's the a valid other party can then can execute it and force yeah. it. Yes. And there's a lot of value in that. Mm -hmm. I mean, because you were going to go through a full trial with all the um, adjournments that could come yeah. and now here you are with a settlement based on your own choices and decisions and you can still execute it as a judgment of the court. And I, I, I suppose, you know, the reference he made to the English case, in our scenario where a judge sees the value of settling and recommends it and you spend that op opportunity, in awarding costs at the end of the trial, mm. you have to know that they can also take that You'll into consideration in, yeah. and, and, and you know, award punitive costs against that client. So those are things you have to um, highlight for the client's attention. Can we talk on this, uh, should I call it a controversial aspect, improper relationships and contacts between lawyers and their clients? We touched a bit on this um, last week when we mm -hmm. talked about lawyers being prohibited from having amorous relations with um, clients who they are representing and that once something like that develops, you have to end the professional relationship. You know, it's like the Bible says, choose you this day who you serve. It's either the love relationship <laughs> or the professional relationship, but the two cannot coexist. Mm -hmm. Um, so in that instance, we are looking at a consensual, burden, romantic relationship, which is not allowed unless you terminate um, one of the relationships. Then you also have a situation in which the client, because in this instance, we are looking at the lawyer's obligations to the client, is made to feel as though if they don't submit to some kind of sexual advance, yeah. you know, then you will not offer them your services or you will not do it to the standard that you are yeah. required to. And it usually will happen where a client is vulnerable. For instance, they are not in a position to pay the fees that yeah. you require them to pay, or they really are not empowered to know their rights and what a lawyer can ask of them and cannot ask. So sometimes you appear to be doing them a favor after court. Oh, I'll give you a lift. But it's just so that when this person sits in your car, you can mm -hmm. have inappropriate conversations yeah. or you know, touch them in inappropriate ways. I mean even outside of the lawyer client relationship that's not yeah. permissible mm -hmm. yeah. much more a lawyer who is placed on a pedestal expected to have a, a higher moral code than the average person so you can't do it to a client you can't do it in the work setting and you should not create an intimidating atmosphere yeah. that um, limits your client from expressing themselves fully or instructing you as they ought mm. I like the fact that you picked it up from the perspective of prohibition of sexual harassment and mm. those kind of improper contacts. But I believe that beyond the sexual space, there could still be some other improper relationships mm. where now because it's your client, you all of a sudden want the person to be an errand boy or girl for you. <laughs> just call, can you send me lunch, and stuff like exactly. that. I want to believe it would also fall within this space. Course, yeah. Or you think that the person can now make any decision without asking you, even outside the scope of your instructions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Think another way is where you have some demands that are very unreasonable. Mm -hmm. Like, this is a young person, all of a sudden you're like, can you be a surrogate for me? Mm -hmm. I, yeah. I'm trying to look at the modern exactly. developments yes, and. Yes how we are evolving and mm -hmm. all the things that people could. Mm -hmm. yeah. It should strictly be a professional relationship. It yeah. should be in relation to the work upon which your, your services are required. Yeah. It shouldn't, I mean, if I may say, extend into social relationships. Mm. Yes, we live in a society, you may end up meeting your client in some other setting other than the lawyer-client relationship. But you should be mindful of the fact that you have a certain unique relationship already existing between you and the client mm. for which you've been paid. Yeah. 
yeah. and a certain expectation is, I mean, looked up for, you mm. know, from you. So even when, for some reason, you end up getting into certain kinds of social situations with your client, you must remember to keep a little bit of a distance between you and the client. Mm. You may end up being, you know, end up maybe at a church activity, yeah. at a, uh, I mean, a funeral. funeral or something of that sort. You should know the extent to which you can go. You shouldn't go beyond the hellos and how I use mm -hmm. and end up wanting to know about their lives and yeah. you know, mm -hmm. trying to you know, <laughs> develop a certain role in their Insist lives. Insist you are invited to all their <laughs> events, <laughs> their mm -hmm. programs yes, at home and all of that. Yes, then you put yourself in a, in, yeah. a, in a difficult situation. The other side of this is a situation where the lawyer you know, also starts trying to have or develop other kinds of relationships, especially something like an agent's relationship with yeah. somebody who maybe goes out there and instigates litigation so as to bring such people to mm -hmm. the lawyer for reward. Yeah. That is also not, that is definitely an inappropriate I think this relationship. flows from the fact that lawyers in our jurisdiction mm -hmm. are not allowed to advertise. Exactly. So it's one of the yeah. I mean, excuses some, I mean, some people would give that because you are not allowed to uh, advertise, mm -hmm. it is okay for you to just get somebody who can go That's out there. That's advertisement, and find. indirectly. And then, indirectly, that is it. Uh, yes, you know, it so is. it's also something that mm -hmm. we have to be watchful about. Mm -hmm. You can't do that because there is the, the, the fear, of course, that you may lose um, the client's independent judgment in dealing with you directly mm -hmm. because there is a third party involved who may have some influence, you know, to bear on the client. Yeah. And the client, I mean, you may be advising the client even possible, as we just spoke about, trying to resolve something amicably. And the person wants you to go ahead and litigate because maybe through the litigation that is when he gets something yeah. from the client so these are things lawyers have to be careful about and ensure that in every situation between you and your client each of you should be able to make an independent judgment about the instructions that you are working with considering how our society is wired people tend to think that after having a long professional relationship mm -hmm. Because of how long litigation normally travels, sometimes three years you're still on with this client and you're consistently in touch with each other, then they expect that you've, you are now family. So all of a sudden you have a major event and they are angry that you did not invite them. And they are angry you did not attend their events. Forgetting that if you were to do that with every client, it would be impossible you to function. Have a life. How do you draw this balance, like where you gently tell clients that, look, now we are done with your case. <laughs> I have new people paying me to work. In fact, it wasn't a natural relationship. It was a contractual one where I was giving, providing a service for money. And so we are not now family members and <laughs> relations. As you say, it's something that is typical with the society. But with some things like that, I believe that you still have to educate your client because you still have that responsibility. It's part of your duty to do so. People get offended considering how we like to be like a tribe. <laughs> exactly, but you still are. have to insist. But you have to be gentle about it. Mm -hmm. you, know, you have to be gentle about it. Some people will be offended by your absence at certain parties, mm -hmm. certain events, etc. Maybe sometimes you can strike a balance, pop in, pop out. If it's but possible. Are you not enabling that whole expectation like mm. you are encouraging? <laughs> exactly. But it's best if you are able to educate the client that you know it's not something that is done. You have been doing you know. this for so long, mm. way longer than me, you mm. both. What do you do? Do you now add them to your family <laughs> uh, tree and then just know you are now part of their <laughs> everything that happens especially when you do divorces it's so personal that exactly. you know you and also because of our obligations as counselors mm. it becomes like this person depends on you now mm -hmm. to take every decision moving forward mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yes they would but then you have to you have to measure what you do with clients you have to be very particular about that you know, I was taught things that are a bit personal, you try to avoid it. Mm -hmm. I remember one of my favorite lecturers telling us that don't give your handkerchief mm. to a, a weeping <laughs> client. 
you know, buy a box of tissues and let the client have it. So you keep a certain distance between you and the client so that the client will know that it's a professional relationship and it won't go beyond that. You wouldn't become a father, you wouldn't become <laughs> a favorite uncle or yeah. something like that. You have to, you have to try it. For also. me, I think the beginning of every relationship is very important. You know, how you set ground rules mm. and as he said, you educate. And as the relationship evolves, you reinforce some of those things. You know, yes, there are people who may start as clients and end up <laughs> virtually friends. becoming close yeah. friends. When you tend to work for those people over the years, so they are not just a case that ends. They <laughs> need regular advice. But when people know your values and what you mm -hmm. stand for, however long the relationship has been for, they know that they can cross certain exactly. lines. And it requires consistency on mm -hmm. your part mm -hmm. as a lawyer. So I have clients who just know that <laughs> <laughs> this thing, <laughs> it won't fly. You know, Victoria says no, it means no. If she says yes, it's yes. If I don't invite you, you know that it's not because we are not close, but you understand that I don't want to ma the lines mm -hmm. that put us in our respective places where you can criticize my work when you are not happy with it, yeah. regardless of the fact that you've been my client for a long time and you respect. No, or I even to I withdraw. Exactly. Yeah. You know? So for me, mm. it's how you present it for the client to understand that, look, I don't want to disempower you by becoming so close that now I am the one in control, even though you are paying me. You mm -hmm. talked about people calling clients and sending them. I saw some of these things when I was doing my internship, where it looks as though <laughs> the client is being done a favor. Mm -hmm. They come in and they carry the lawyer's bag and things around. That's not right. Mm -hmm. Even if it's a pro bono service, yeah. it's not right. It's not a question of you know, using the person for some in-kind consideration. Um, whether or not they are paying you. Mm. So right from day one, if you let a client understand that, hey, you are the employer, I'm the employee, you instruct. Of course, you don't order me around yeah. as a lab dog, but you have so much power. And to make sure that you don't lose that power and that control and the ability to voice your concerns, let's not get too pali-pali. And I think when you put it in that context, they begin to appreciate because there's a fine line between um, maintaining a professional relationship yeah. and becoming conflicted. If you are going to ask someone to be your surrogate while they are your client, there's a conflict between yeah. representing their best interest and your personal interest yeah. that you are seeking. So um, it's all about setting boundaries mm -hmm. and being consistent about maintaining mm -hmm. those boundaries. Mm -hmm. And as he said, gently and respectfully explaining that, look, it's not me, there are rules. <laughs> yeah. And we have to make sure that we don't, you know, um, mm -hmm. let things get confused. Mm -hmm. It's okay. for our mutual uh, interest Benefit. and yeah. benefits. Yes. One question you always get asked, which you know, I prefer never to be asked, but it always counts, is where do you come from? Ah. <laughs> <laughs> and most of the time, I mean, as soon as you answer, the client is able to quickly identify mm. somebody from there. Connected and, to and you. Starts, you know, I, mean, I know this person, mm -hmm. I know your uncle, I mm -hmm. know this other person, and kind of like that. Oh, and the worst one is I knew you when you were little. I knew. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Yeah. So I try as much as possible. I mean, if I ask that question, I respond, I'm a Ghanaian. Yeah. Oh, I'm a Ghanaian. Nice. You know, they try, they ask <laughs> Which part questions, of Ghana? But I, I leave it like that, just yeah. to let you know that it's not an area yeah. I want to go to. Yeah. Um, so it is important that we stress this point, mm. that it is especially in the client's interest mm. that there is a separation exactly. of these uh, interactions mm. and you maintain professional mm -hmm. uh, engagements exactly. and keep it at that level mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because even where the client decides to discontinue the engagement where you are now like family how do they leave mm. i see people complain every day oh my lawyer is not doing his job but mm. you know mm -hmm. i can't let him go he's now like a brother yeah. this is where these things exactly. end up mm -hmm. yeah. 
you know so it's it's important that uh, there's that pro strict professional yes. relationship yes. between lawyers and their clients we'll go for a quick commercial break when mm -hmm. we come back we will uh, we'll continue with uh, withdrawal of services mm -hmm. as a lawyer don't go away this is law express <laughs> Not every relationship has to end. <laughs> Some must end through death, mm -hmm. uh, like marriage. But like every contractual relationship, the same way it has a commencement and a duration, provision is made for termination. Yeah. And it's either the client is firing you or saying, thank you very much, you've done your best, I no longer wish to um, retain your services. Mm -hmm. Or it may be the lawyer withdrawing. And Every proper relationship between a lawyer and a client will be governed by an engagement uh, letter or engagement terms. We talked about agreeing on fees. Usually when you <coughs> have the engagement um, terms, it will also or should have provision for when it is a lawyer can withdraw. Mm -hmm. But over and above that, there are legitimate grounds under which a lawyer may seek to withdraw. For instance, when it's a court uh, matter, the lawyer can file an application to the court mm -hmm. and justify why the court must grant the lawyer permission to withdraw. So you begin to see the duty that we owe to the client is such that sometimes we cannot just voluntarily choose not to appear in court on their behalf. When we have filed a claim or a defense on their behalf or mm -hmm. when the case has traveled to a certain stage, regardless of what is in your agreement, you may not be able to withdraw without the permission of the court before which you are representing the client. However, the starting point is the agreement between you and the client. And typical clauses that you'll find, for instance, are where it becomes apparent that the client no longer has confidence in your ability to represent them. Mm -hmm. That will be legitimate grounds for you to withdraw because <coughs> if you don't have confidence, it means you're not listening to exactly. anything I say. And it's not a contract of servitude. Mm -hmm. You are not bound to me and I'm not bound to you. At that point in time, if you owe me or I have collected money that I haven't worked for, we work it out. If I have to refund, I must. If I must defray or charge you and refund something, I do that. So that's one of the grounds. Another will be, for instance, I need you to furnish me with information that will enable me to um, pursue your interest. Because I would have made it one of the terms that you must give me information that is relevant in a timeless mm -hmm. manner. And if it becomes apparent that you are consistently withholding that information, yeah. that is a legitimate ground for me to mm -hmm. say that, I'm sorry, where we have reached, I'm not the best person to represent mm -hmm. you. Where you want to take over the case. I know I mentioned that the client is the one who makes the decision, mm -hmm. but I drive the car after mm -hmm. you have decided where we are going, and how you want to get there, and what you are prepared to pay for it. And if at every point you want to change the gears and you can't trust my judgment, then I must leave the car for you to drive and I will walk. So I will let you know that where we have reached, by my code of ethics, I cannot take a subordinate position yeah. in the conduct mm -hmm. of the case. Yeah. And since it, you, you understand the law better, I must respectfully stand aside. Sometimes the client is not paying. Um, and a lawyer is entitled to withdraw their services because we've made an agreement that you pay in a particular manner. The invoice is raised, you don't pay. Where I work, we have a, 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 a policy that I think is due for overhaul. We never sue clients who don't pay us. The, my old <laughs> man there, that has been his policy. But times are changing, and so that may also change. And because it can be a drain on your resources, yeah. it compromises your loyalty to the client's business. You know, lawyers joke about the fact that their brains will not start functioning mm -hmm. when they <laughs> haven't been paid. Yeah. Yes, even the good book says that every laborer deserves their wages. Mm -hmm. So non-payment of fees can be a legitimate ground for a lawyer to withdraw from handling a matter. But sometimes a client may owe you heavily and a, a court will refuse to grant you leave because they look at the circumstances of the case, the complexity or how far you have gone. Maybe certain witnesses have come. They are at a critical stage. Yeah. You'll find a court declining to grant you leave to, to withdraw. withdraw. <laughs> yes. So it starts with mutually agreed terms. 
And then it also starts with um, ethical reasons, like the client expecting you to mislead a court, for instance. Yeah. That is a ground for you to say, if you insist that I do this and I cannot do that which is illegal or unethical, that's a basis for you also to withdraw your services. Mm -hmm. And when it becomes necessary for you to withdraw, mm -hmm. when under no circumstances are you able to continue, or situations such as um, where your physiology is unable to you know, manage the case. So where your mental something, and physical exactly. states, maybe you are sick. You are sick, you are yeah. tired or something. You know, you Bent have out. to yes, speak to the client, explain to the client, and then you put everything down in a letter so that, if possible, the client can give it to the next lawyer mm -hmm. who would be able to take it from where you left off. Okay. So it's not something that is about you just walking mm. away, but it should be done in such a way that the next person who takes over should be sufficiently informed mm -hmm. about what you have done so that the person can take on mm -hmm. the duties. I think with uh, withdrawal, mm. that for me, there are two overriding uh, um, facts that must be at play. The fact that you should have a good course mm. and you also just oppose that uh, to the interest of the client, such that you don't jeopardize their case moving forward. Mm. I mean, to be sad if mm -hmm. for a reason that you couldn't show up anymore, they lose a the case. Mm -hmm. Whereas you could have probably just done one more appearance exactly. to salvage things mm. before you walk away. Because mm -hmm. mostly when a lawyer is withdrawing, which is not too common, because mm -hmm. it's rather clients taking their briefs. Exactly. Mm -hmm. There's something really at play that makes it impossible for that lawyer to, um, to, to continue. Mm. And another thing that clients also have to know is that, especially when you have a case pending in court and your lawyer withdraws or you sack them, mm -hmm. when you move to the next lawyer, before that lawyer takes any step, they must find out from your former lawyer if they have any objection. Because between the two lawyers, there's a binding code that says that when you receive a brief, and you can tell that somebody else was working on it in a pending matter before the court, before you do anything, you Contact must write yeah. to the other lawyer for them to confirm that they have no objection. It's a protective mechanism uh, you know, to ensure that clients don't go lawyer hopping mm -hmm. yeah. and um, avoid their obligations. Fees, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I think another way this can manifest is where whilst you're actively in court with a client, mm. they are exploring other ways of resolving the matter without you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, then they show up with some terms that you didn't advise mm -hmm. because it also goes back to the mm -hmm. ethics. Mm -hmm. um, did they understand what they did? Mm -hmm. um, and also the implications on you exactly. playing the lame duck role mm -hmm. in all of this mm -hmm. uh, conversation. Mm -hmm. We sampled the opinion of people as usual okay. from the streets and would like to take a listen so mm. we can react to this. Obligations of a lawyer to his or her client is confidentiality. As a lawyer, you have to keep the information of your client confidential. That is not letting any third party having access to his or her information with or without his or her knowledge. The obligations of a lawyer to his clients is to provide competent, diligent and prompt services and advice to his clients. This means that the lawyer is supposed to be there for his client, to provide efficient and prompt services and advice to his clients whenever they need be. Lawyers are supposed to keep their, their information confidential. They shouldn't expose their clients' information. And when also talking of the professionalism, they are also to keep their work um, in a professional way. They are supposed to keep their work in a professional way. The obligation of a lawyer to his client is to uphold his dignity, which means a lawyer must work with all manner of seriousness and style. Yes, and he's supposed to respect himself against his profession. 
the obligation of a lawyer to his client is for the lawyer to always make sure that he never takes a client's brief at their workplace or residence, instead at the lawyer's office. So no matter what happens, the lawyer should always take a client to his office. Obligations of a lawyer. I personally think a lawyer has a lot of obligations and some of them are giving advice to their clients, also representing their clients in court, and also acting on the interests of their clients. So then, as a lawyer, they basically help or stand in for people, their clients, when it comes to issues that they are facing and they are supposed to resolve them in the court. The obligations of a lawyer is to provide legal advice or representation to their clients and to conduct legal research and to maintain client's confidentiality and to keep clients informed. Uh, mostly they get the idea, they get the idea, it's just uh, the extras, mm -hmm. that's, and that's mm -hmm. the justification for our conversation today, yes. if yeah. you ask me. Mm. Well, I found it interesting that one of them talked about conducting, um, you know, legal research, mm -hmm. and that dovetails into the role of a lawyer to really exert themselves to um, represent a client with competence. Um, and how quickly you can even act on a client's matter depends on your thorough preparation. Yeah. So we owe that duty to, um, first of all, accept instructions in matters that we know we have the competence to act. Yes, you go to law school and you are taught, you are taught everything, but you don't come out as a specialist in every area of practice. And you have to be honest not to accept cases where you know you do not have the competence to do the work or it's going to cost the client so much more because you are now going to learn about <laughs> that area to the level that um, you know someone else will just take it and dissect the issues and know what to do nothing wrong with developing your understanding of a new area uh, of an or field of endeavor but when you take on that case you must know that you have the capacity to give competent legal advice, to act promptly, and not to um, act in a manner that will be detrimental to the interest of the client. Mm -hmm. So conducting legal research, yes, but the basic <laughs> knowledge and understanding and the capacity to handle that suit must be there. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, and sometimes it is also the case that lawyers collaborate. Yes. There are some who are more experienced in certain areas yeah. better than you may be and there's nothing wrong mm -hmm. in letting your client know that you may have to call in a bigger gun <laughs> so that you'll be able to do a better job for yeah. the client and it's allowed mm -hmm. you speak to a senior colleague or another colleague could even be a junior colleague but the person has a special training in an aspect of the law that the case may be you know about you speak to such a person and then there is that collaboration and you proceed accordingly in that manner. There are certain situations people will hear courts in courts, mm -hmm. lawyers announce themselves saying they are leading mm -hmm. somebody or yeah. somebody is leading them. Mm -hmm. That is one of the situations. It's not always the case that the, pair, the two of them come from the same, same. office. Mm -hmm. yeah. but sometimes they might be in different offices, but as a result of another person's extra Mm -hmm. speciality mm -hmm. in that particular area. You may appeal to such lawyer to help you, and that is fine. You will be able to give so the So this is the you appealing advice. to lawyers mm -hmm. to shake off their learned caps and yeah. put on their learning caps. Exactly. <laughs> it's just like doctors where <laughs> they would speak to a more experienced colleague to get guidance about how to deal with a particular situation. We do the same thing. You can't be a master of everything. can't be a master of everything, mm -hmm. yes. It's, it's and you okay. should be honest with yourself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If it's beyond your competence mm. level, speak to somebody else. If it is the case that you would then recommend to the client that yeah. I think this particular person has the special knowledge of this problem and is going to be able to offer you the best service, yeah. tell the client and give the client the option to approach mm. that person. But if right. you can also get that person to support you mm -hmm. in representing the client, that is also allowed. Mm -hmm. um, we skipped one other thing, which I think we should go back to, which is failure to attend court mm -hmm. by lawyers. Mm. It does happen sometimes. Maybe something might 
create that problem. We are human beings, maybe you are ill, mm -hmm. or sometimes the scheduling is such that you may have a clash of cases because there are certain situations where you may not have a, an involvement in the setting of a particular date, especially mm -hmm. where applications are being filed by your colleagues. Sometimes they would look and choose a date that fits their diary, but it may not be uh, a date that uh, is suitable for you. But can this run through all the time? Like not every all single the time. Month? Because not I've seen time. instances where people have initiated suits, mm. filed a writ, and probably thrown on uh, uh, an application for an injunction to boot, and then just disappear. Mm. Yes. So they leave the work for mm. the defendant's or respondent's mm. lawyer, mm -hmm. and just move on, carry yes. on with their lives. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. But then in the proper situation if you, for some reason you are not able to attend to court best practice is to send a letter yeah to the court best of all again to send it the day before but even if on the particular day there's a problem and you are not able to get there at least speak to your client if your client is there before you at least to speak to the clerk of the court and inform the clerk that this is the situation you find yourself in as a result of which you haven't been able to arrive. The judges would always look for how much effort you have made to inform the court about the difficulty that you are and in. And counsel on the other side. Exactly. Mm -hmm. But in situations where, I mean, for instance, somebody goes to court to tell the court that my lawyer has been sick for some time mm -hmm. and therefore is not around, but the, the lawyer hasn't taken the trouble to send in an excuse duty form from a doctor or something like that, you incur the displeasure of the court. You see, we have to always remember that we are officers of the court. We are our client's representatives, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, and then we owe a duty to the public as well. So in doing whatever we do, we must be mindful of these duties. Mm -hmm. So as much as possible, we have to treat the court and our clients with the due respect they deserve. Great. And just to add, um, you know, apart from fundamentally, a lawyer has a duty to appear in court whenever a case they are involved in is scheduled mm -hmm. for hearing. Mm -hmm. And if you are going to be absent, it must be because you have a reasonable mm -hmm. excuse and you must arrange for another lawyer to yeah. hold your brief um, or some agent from your firm, somebody to be present failing which the letter may then mm. go. I mean, yeah. I don't particularly care for letters if the reason in the letter is not, is not justifiable, reason. especially when you mm. don't inform the lawyer or, or on the other side and the reason you are giving is something that was foreseeable. Yeah. And you know that the other party probably is traveling from another region. I will take costs. <laughs> yes, and I will ask the court also to proceed notwithstanding your letter, because it is not fair to the court, it is not fair to my client, it is not fair to me to wake up, sit in traffic, come to court prepared, and especially when you are the one who has filed a process that yeah. has summoned everybody, everybody to yeah. come. So you have a duty to appear, and if you are not going to be able to be there, you must trigger certain things. Mm -hmm. There must be a backup, failing which then this letter which he mentioned, and as you said, your a uh, friend on the other side must be aware. Uh, you shouldn't be finding out in court unless mm -hmm. it was an emergency mm -hmm. um, that the person had no control over and could not send. Even because, with emergencies. Uh -huh, because sometimes you are even, apart from incurring the displeasure of the court, you embarrass your exactly. clients. There's nothing worse than a case being called and the client being asked, where's your lawyer? Uh -huh. My lawyer is he said, not oh, here. He said he's coming. He said, step out and call. And then 30 minutes later, he's called, where's he's your lawyer? He's not picking up. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I know some clients, they will leave that courtroom and they will fire you, and yeah. justifiably so. Yeah, exactly. You know, and then, of course, on the day that you don't show up also, the court may decide to proceed yeah. and make a decision that <laughs> you may never be able to reverse. Mm -hmm. So um, it is a misconduct where it turns out that your absence from court was for an unjustifiable reason or even where there was a reasonable excuse, you had the opportunity to put mechanisms in place yeah. to protect your client's interest, but you failed to. When they report you to the General Legal Council, yeah, you can be sanctioned for um, absenting yourself mm -hmm. from court. You, you talked about the letter and yes. having to serve same on counsel on the other side. Mm -hmm. Even beyond that, there are ways you could still, in our modern world, 
You can mm. put in a phone call. You can oh, send yes. a message. <laughs> Email. You know, the West is where council shows up ready and the letter shows. Mm -hmm. And for the very first time, exactly. he or she is. Mm -hmm. And, you know, people have to balance a lot of things to mm -hmm. be able to appear in mm -hmm. some courts mm -hmm. on some days, mm -hmm. depending on the business there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's uh, an application that had to be moved mm -hmm. and the person had equally important mm -hmm. matters somewhere, but had to sacrifice to be there mm -hmm. to indulge you. Mm -hmm. And then you decide not to show mm -hmm. up mm -hmm. and you don't have the decency and the courtesy to, to at least to inform the person yeah. to readjust to the situation. Yeah. And it's necessary, again, for us to remember this thing that we said last week. The lawyer is selling his time. Mm -hmm. He's selling his integrity. He's selling his intellect. Mm -hmm. yeah. So work has been done. Some would have stayed through the night to prepare. Mm -hmm. Then how fair is it for the person to get to court and then be told that mm -hmm. the other lawyer is absent mm -hmm. without a reason mm -hmm. or without a justifiable reason? Mm -hmm then his client is supposed to pay mm -hmm. but not much work in terms of the appearance yeah. would be done mm -hmm. and then the client would then have to pay for more appearances mm -hmm. that the court the, the 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 lawyer would have to to to, to do so it's not really fair mm -hmm. at all for a lawyer to fail to give notice to the other side that because of this particular issue i may not have I may not be able to appear. And it is necessary that when there is the opportunity to agree on dates to appear, mm -hmm. it is necessary for there to be a lot of candor shown. Mm -hmm. you know? If you know that you have other cases on a particular day, mm -hmm. you don't suggest that particular date because you think that, well, let me go and do this and forget about this. Sometimes some people will look at their schedule, look at who which of their clients is Juicy paying, <laughs> then they and decide that, well, that I'd rather go to this one. This one is not paying. So wherever I fix the person, no problem. That is misconduct. Mm. That shouldn't be done. It's time for another break. Mm. We'll go uh, for that. And when we return, we pick up the conversation from here. Mm. Don't go away. This is Law Express. <laughs> important also to note is that you know we talk about conduct that incurs the displeasure of the court or embarrasses the client um, but there's also a duty that as a lawyer you owe to the legal profession and that means that you preserve the dignity and the honor of the profession I mean you hear a lot of people saying lawyers are liars why is that because they've encountered one lawyer in their entire life who has given them that impression and that becomes mm -hmm. the narrative so we all have a duty as lawyers to make sure that we preserve the dignity um, of the profession. We maintain our own dignity. And that is why you can't be doing things like not showing up in court or deploying that as a strategy to delay the conduct of a matter. Um, we also have a duty to uphold the laws of Ghana. It underpins everything that we do. So in discharging our obligations to the clients, we can't do anything that is contrary to any law. It may be tax loss. Uh -huh. The client wants to evade tax. No, there's proper tax planning advice that you can give. But you cannot be advising a client to be evading tax and um, depriving the government of revenue that must be generated. You, and you must maintain your own integrity. And that also means that you will not be a conduit for um, misrepresenting facts to the court or even treating the other lawyer or the other party unfairly. It is as serious to the point where you have a client who has instructed you, but when you are aware of a legal authority that is not in support of their case, you are under an obligation to disclose it to the court. Yeah. Yes. So, um, you know, the important thing, or my, the, the, for me, my final words would be that in dealing with clients, mm -hmm. much as you let them understand your obligations to them, they have to understand that there's a whole framework within which you discharge those obligations. And there are stakeholders who must equally be treated with the um, same level of integrity and um, truthfulness. And 
once they understand that, you know, they know what they can expect of you, what they can demand of you, what they are entitled to, and the lines that they must not cross. Mm -hmm. They also know what they can do to hold you to account when you do not hold your end of the bargain. Because I will always let a client know that, look, if you are not happy with my services, there's my boss or somebody <laughs> above. But if that doesn't satisfy you, by all means, go to the regulator. Yeah. Because that's a check on me to make sure that I live by the code and I do right by my clients and all those involved. Yeah. It is not the case that lawyers simply pull out their palms and ask for silver to be crossed and then everything at all you ask them to do, they have to do. That is not what we do. As we have explained, we are counselors, we are advisors, we are evaluators, and then we are advocates, we are negotiators. So there are so many things we do, and it's not as if we are mere spokesmen yeah. endowed with the ability to speak English. Mm -hmm. So you just come and think that, oh, the little I give to this person, the person is going out there, and whatever quote-unquote rubbish I want to put out there, the person mm -hmm. is going to do it. It doesn't work that way. We owe an obligation to our profession as well. Yeah. We owe an obligation to the betterment of the country. Mm then we owe an obligation to you, the client. So we deal with all these things together. So if you come to a lawyer and for some reason the lawyer is, is, is advising you about how to deal with something and you think that it is not the right way and you want to go in, a, in another way that may not be suitable, that may not be wholesome, if the lawyer says no, you should understand. Mm. It's not some, I mean, we are not, yes, we are bound to accept every brief, but there is a qualification. Mm. We can't accept briefs that, you know, I mean, lead to the tarnishing of the image of the, of the legal profession. We can't do that. If you are giving a lawyer a case to do and it borders on fraud, expecting that the lawyer goes and defends criminal conduct or something that is fraudulent, of course, the lawyer has to be careful about it. It's a different thing if you, I mean, the person has en engaged in a, a crime mm. and requires representation before the courts, before maybe the person's liberty is restrained. That is a different situation. So we, we, we have a very sensitive duty yeah. and clients have to understand you know, if there are certain situations where we advise against certain courses of conduct the clients would have to understand that. Right. The lawyer-client relationship must be weighed on the balance of the mutual interests of both parties involved. Mm -hmm. This has been the second part of our conversation on the lawyer-client relationship within the context of the obligations owed by the lawyer to his clients. We'd like to thank <laughs> Mrs. Victoria Bath and Mr. Nathan Yani for joining us again for the second part on this topic. My name is Noella Seydu. Thank you for joining us today. Goodbye, and this has been Law Express.